All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Fantastic Story Society. Scott, what do we have on hand today? And um, I already know, but yeah, <laughs> get into it. Well, you know, we've had requests to do an episode that touches on the topic of cults and cults have come up in some past Fantastic Story Society episodes, specifically our paranormal investigation with Lisa Van Buskirk when we were in the Tempest restaurant, which oddly enough, unexpectedly enough, was also a site where a past member of Heaven's Gate or maybe even not an official member, but somebody that followed the Heaven's Gate cult committed suicide around the same time as everybody in the the San Diego area uh, conducted that mass suicide. Yeah. Um, and so we've been looking around for a little bit for who would be an ideal interview subject. And boy, oh boy, did we find the right one. Couldn't, couldn't have found a better <laughs> one. This uh, Rick is just, he knows everything there is to know. Um, how quickly he was able to recall answers yeah. and, you know, to some of the detailed questions we asked. Um, I mean, for anybody who likes true crime, you really can't get yeah. much bigger because there's so much intrigue. I, I think, you know, the one problem I have with true crime is that it kind of it explodes the entertainment factor of it all. Mm, and that's sure. one reason why I can't, I just don't love watching true crime documentaries and shows. It's just so real that there's no fantasy and, and it's so sad, regardless yeah. of what the true crime might be. Um, and when it comes to cults, whew, talk about difficult yeah. topic, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, you know, I was doing a lot of research for the last couple of months, uh, just reading or watching everything I could. And there's a lot of content out there uh, showing that people do have this fascination with it. And for one, Rick kept popping up as the expert that they were interviewing. So that was a good signal that this is a good person to talk to. I think one of the things that was eye opening to me was just how many of them there are out there uh, through time and even in present day. That was mind blowing to me. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, true crime, Max, because one of the things I wanted to talk about and we didn't get to because there's just so much to cover is why do we all find cult stories so interesting, so fascinating? And do you think it's just similar to the, you know, the, the popular interest in true crime stories? No, I think it's definitely that. But I think it's also just the idea of normal people having this experience like you, there's you could just see yourself and someone who's a part of this cult. Like I've, like I mentioned in the interview, I've been taken to a couple different seminars over the past 20 years, not realizing it was landmark or, you know, some type of <laughs> early initiation process sure. because it was like colored as, you know, personal growth, self-help or something. And as I'm sitting there, I'm realizing, Oh, I got to get out of this place. <laughs> and I think there's this connection to uh, relatability, I guess. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Cause I, I think that there is something there, whether it's people would like to watch these stories to feel um, elevated that, Oh, well, they would never get me, but, but maybe in the back of their mind, they, they understand that we are all manipulatable. And so maybe we are all susceptible to some degree. And I, I unfortunately, I think that's true that sure. if somebody hits you the right way, finds the right entry point, then they can start leading you into this dark place uh, that, I mean if, totally. if you were to see the end of it, you would say no right away, but you, you don't see the end of it until you're way into it already. Yeah, that was a great point that he made about what makes for a great movie about cults and how, you know, air quote, bad movie is when they just too quickly become inundated and then, and then suddenly they're in the cult and now they're, you know, you know slashing people's chests open. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. wait a minute, how did we get here? And in real life, it takes a long time. It's a slow process of just manipulating people. And I think like I said, near the end of the interview, just how dangerous narcissism is. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, this is not a political podcast, <laughs> not at all. but we did bring up the, you know, the divisiveness in um, the country at the moment. Um, and even though he does say that, you know, Donald Trump is not a cult leader and it isn't a cult, the more we talked about it, <laughs> that was like, you sure? But no, it's, <laughs> I get it from a, a, a literal standpoint of, you know, how it is defined and what it is these cult leaders actually do. But that's a big part of the conversation. There's a fine line. I don't know. When you look around your life experience and the friends, you know, uh, it's kind of wild sometimes how many cult stories are closer to us than you think about and until you sit down and think about it. You realize that boy, I, I know a lot of friends that have had brushes with cults, either a friend or a, a family member of theirs was in a cult. I had a, a long time, one of my best friends in high school, I, I mentioned that I was doing this episode and she's like, oh, 
well, this is great because I just found out that I grew up in a cult. Like, oh, wait, my God. What? Yeah, it was, it was, this person was researching Heaven's Gate just from, you know, again, the typical curiosity interest and ended up hearing her church mentioned in the same breath as how Heaven's Gate operated. Like, oh, my gosh, it was, it was another wow. it was a doomsday type of church that's still in existence today. And then also, I don't know if you ever heard about this, but one of our mutual friends right before she moved to London, just like you were talking about doing a self-help seminar. Yeah. That's a very common method tactic, apparently in modern day cults, you know, she's an artist, a a self-employed running her own business type of person and wants to be better at it. It's an obvious relatable concept. So she got a recommendation from a friend that, Hey, you should uh, go to this seminar that's down in Marina del Rey. And I believe it was like $500 for the three day weekend. (laughs) And she's like, well, I'm taking it seriously. So I'm putting my money into this because it's going to help me in my business. And something just smelled wrong. You know, something was a little bit off during it. There was, yes, there was good messaging and positive things about it. But for one, it was, it was like 15 hours on day one. It was a long, long, long oh, seminar. No. And then you got teamed up with somebody like an accountability buddy, which again is on the face of it, possibly a good thing. But what you had to do was when you went home that night, with your very short turnaround, every two hours, you had to wake up and call each other to make sure that you're coming back the next day. Oh, boy. Basically, it's sleep deprivation torture, because then you have less ability to think rationally, to make up your own mind. She didn't know what to do. Like, I I feel like I don't want to go back because this feels bad and like a cult. And she had me research it. And I looked it up. I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of bad information out there about this place. (laughs) Don't go back. But she said, but I actually care about getting better learning. I shouldn't say getting better like she's sick, but you know, learning for her business. I invested so much money. I don't want to just bail now. And that is something cults do a lot too, is make sure you invest a lot. So you feel bad that you can't leave guilt. It's yeah, there's guilt. There's, I mean, personal investment in a number of different ways, whether it's financial or time commitment. Uh, it's, it's wild. And that was again, like anybody can relate to that entry point of, Hey, I want to be better at running my own business. And next thing you know, you're giving up your everything, then isolating from friends and family. And so fortunately, she didn't go back, but she was really, you know, even after just one day, it was a struggle to say, no, I'm not going to go back tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, just just um, be careful with your intentions and other people's intentions. That's the hard part because they pray, they, the cults pray on people who don't have a strong self center and they then tell them what their center is. And so we've got to spend time on our own trying to just center ourselves and figure out what our own personal truths are not truth in terms of what's going on in the world. And, you know, I'm not talking about conspiracy theories, but just you got to get into this level of understanding how you feel and how you react to certain, certain things. At the same time, I don't think this person we were talking about, you know, our friend was necessarily dealing with really low self-esteem or anything. They just got indoctrinated with this level of, Oh, I'm trying to pursue my career. And then, you know, they (laughs) take it from there, but there is a, a need that everybody has when they're going to a seminar like that, whatever sure. the need is. And then they feed that need. Oh, that's just opening the door. When you say yeah. I'm coming to something, then it's kind of like a self-help thing, whether it's Tony Robbins or whatever, you're kind of admitting that there's maybe some places where your life could be better totally. and the, totally. the, the cults will feed on that. Yeah. And it's certainly important to, you know, not paint with too broad a brush because different cults target different people for different reasons. And so even really well healthy, quote unquote, the healthiest of people are still susceptible. Yeah. Well, we're going to skip our, how are you? What's going on in Mm -hmm. your life between the two of us? Everything's fine. (laughs) We're we're excited about this episode. Mm -hmm. Huge thanks to Rick Ross for for jumping on. What is the website again? Scott, everybody hears it up front. It is culteducation.com for the Cult Education Institute. Check it out. There's a free message board you can post anonymously if you do think you are in one or you know you're in one and you want help or you know someone else who is in one, uh, you would like to help them go there. It's a fantastic website. Rick has been doing this a long time in terms of what he uses this term, uh, deep programming to try mm-hmm. to help people away from these really, you know, very destructive situations. But so let's get to it. We'll get into our interview here with Rick Ross. Enjoy the show. As we call into session, 
Uh, the majority of our members are storytellers, but you know, I always really love our inductees who are researchers, documentarians, and investigative journalists. Uh, we are very excited to induct a new member uh, who is one of the absolute foremost experts about a very shady element of society. Uh, the work he does cannot be overstated for its value in both rescuing people and, like in this episode, just getting the word out and raising awareness. He has worked closely with the Branch Davidians and the FBI during the standoff in Waco, Texas in the 1990s, and more recently with survivors of the Nexium cult. You can check out his massive resource, the Cult Education Institute, free and open to the public at culteducation.com. And you can pick up his comprehensive book, Cults Inside Out, How People Get In and can get out. As we induct this new member, it is a good time to point out that you are free to leave at any time. There is no <laughs> punishment for leaving. And I personally lack the charisma to be considered a charismatic leader. So you're very safe here. Yeah. Uh, we welcome our newest member of the Fantastic Story Society, Mr. Rick Allen Ross. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Rick. This is exciting. We take t subjects and discuss them, you know, from a wide range. And you know, a lot of times, some of the subjects, you can easily be skeptical and go, well, okay, well, you know, UFOs, aliens or whatever. But this particular subject, there's no skepticism. <laughs> it's, these things are true and real. Um, and so the real scary, I think, of course, is that much scarier. Um, and we'll get into all of that. But um, why don't we start a little bit just talking about the idea of a cult and and what the so-called definition is, because I was joking around a little bit with, with Scott before we started here, because to me personally, and obviously you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like there's a pretty fine line in terms of what the definition might entail, because I'm a huge Cubs fan. And I, you could argue being part of a sports fan club could be even cultish in, in ways. And, you know, I hate it when people say bad things about the Cubs, even though I might agree with them. <laughs> so why don't we talk about that a little bit, just kind of get some upfront ideas about what really a cult is. I spend an entire chapter on this, uh, on this issue, defining a destructive cult. And I would say there's a nucleus for the definition of a destructive cult, and that's composed of three core elements. Number one, a charismatic leader who becomes an object of worship. And that leader is typically a man, totalitarian, no meaningful accountability. Whatever he says is right is right. Whatever he says is wrong is wrong. And that's it. And then second, the group uses a, a synthesis of coercive persuasion, thought reform and influence techniques to gain undue influence over the membership. And then finally, they use that undue influence to do damage to people. Now, that, that can vary by degree from group to group. Some groups are just after your money. Other groups are after money, free labor. It can escalate, and it can even become criminal, as you mentioned with the Waco Davidians or Nexium, led by Keith Ranieri. But those are the three core elements. All-powerful leader, who is the defining element and driving force of the group, the process of thought reform to gain undue influence over people that is mandated and, and systematic in the group, and number three, using that to leverage control to the extent that you hurt people. So yeah, you use a phrase there I wanted to ask a question about because I do see a lot in, in well, your book. And by the way, I am most of the way through it. It is uh, really comprehensive. Very, very interesting. Um, you cover so many different uh, examples of cults through history at the beginning. And then, of course, getting into the weeds of what it's like to talk to a, maybe a family member or friend that is in a cult and how to you know walk you through that process. Uh, but uh, the phrase is destructive cult. Is there a such thing as a non-destructive cult? Because, you know, like you said, even if they're not, you know, if it doesn't end in a mass suicide or, you know, big criminal violence or anything like that, there's still a lot of destructiveness going on in these other cults. So is there a non-destructive cult? Yes, I would call that a benign cult. For example, uh, there is a community north of Phoenix in Arizona called Arcosante, which was founded by Paulo Soleri. Uh, the whole concept of the community is based on a philosophy called arcology. And Paulo Soleri, until his death, was the defining element and driving force of the community, which is about uh, bringing together a kind of urban uh, bubble that uh, saves the environment, keeps people all together in a community. 
And for decades, Paulo Soleri was building his city, Arcosante, out in the desert. Uh, there were many people who came and went, and many people that really uh, saw Soleri as an icon, as the defining element and driving force of the group. But I never once got a complaint. And I've been doing my work since 1982. So this would be an example of a benign cult. Other examples could be CrossFit, Soul Cycle, ah. and other groups where people are very dedicated, uh, but the group is not really harming people. And I think that that is why we need to make distinctions between, for example, a movie star or a singer who has a cult following, the Grateful Dead, <laughs> a rock and roll group had a following yeah. called okay. the Deadheads. But, you know, sure. Jerry, Jerry Garcia wasn't plotting the demise of the dead, <laughs> dead heads. He was happy that they were coming to his concerts. He made a lot of money from those people, very devoted, going from concert to concert, following the group. But it was a, a benign cult. It wasn't a destructive cult. And I think that uh, it's important to recognize not only that there are benign cults, but that destructive cults. Uh, vary by degree. Some are much worse than others. Not every group has a compound, and not every group is kind of scheming how they will deal with doomsday, like David Koresh and the Waco Davidians. Going back to Max's and opening, being a Cubs fan, which that I, that's borderline a destructive cult, self-destructive. <laughs> very, um, but, very funny. But so you you kind of would consider that you know like super fandom of a team even being cult like in a way. We have to parse the language and say, yeah. well, there's such a thing as a, a cult brand, a cult following. Uh, there are different ways of using the word cult. Yeah. But when most people use the word cult, they're thinking destructive cult. Yes. They're, they're thinking the Waco Davidians again, the, the Moonies let, uh, founded the organization, the Unification Church founded by Reverend Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, many people consider Scientology a cult, which was started by L. Ron Hubbard in the 1950s and includes celebrities like Tom Cruise, John Travolta, Kirstie Alley. So there's an array of groups uh, that, that have been called cults, and some of them are very notoriously destructive and have gone down in history as uh, groups that have actually killed people, been responsible yeah. for uh, mass suicides, murders. Uh, other groups get lots of complaints because they take advantage of people. Uh, they isolate them. They break them away from their old friends and family. Uh, they may cause damage to their career, uh, to their education. And people may give years and years of their life to a particular group and then realize this is not for me but they've lost those years. Yeah. It's, and then the, the freedom and their whole network of what they know, uh, you know, all of their friends, everything around them, it's hard to leave once you're that far in. Yeah. That's what a, a that's what a sociologist, Benjamin uh, Zablocki, who taught at Rutgers, would call exit costs. And I talk about that in my book, that people want to know, well, why don't people just leave? I mean, if the group's that bad, just make tracks and get out. But the answer is, at what cost? What are the exit costs of leaving the group? Uh, there are many young people, uh, for example, Leah Remeni, who was raised in Scientology, uh, or Beck, the rock musician, who was also raised in Scientology, mm -hmm. or for that matter, River Phoenix, the actor and brother of Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, the Phoenix family was in a group called the Children of God, a terrible group. Yeah. If, you, if you leave a group, do you leave your family behind? Uh, or can you take your family with you? which is what Leah Remini was able to do. But many people fear that they can't do that. And that if they leave the group, they will lose people they love. And they're so enmeshed with the group socially, uh, through family relationships that they just feel glued in. And uh, it makes it very difficult to imagine a life outside of the group. In particular, we, we've seen this with the polygamist 
cults, uh, groups like the FLDS, led by Warren Jeffs, who's now languishing in prison in Texas. When young people leave these groups, they don't know where to go. Uh, the group has existed for about 100 years, and there are multi-generations going all the way back that have been in this group. So what do you do when you decide to leave? If, uh, for example, uh, you're a, a, a young woman who doesn't want to become a polygamist wife and you leave the group, where do you go? How do you start your life over again? It's very rough. So I guess maybe that's a good segue then into this term deprogramming. I had never heard of that term, at least in terms of, you know, in relation to this subject, but um because you've you've had a lot of battles in in your history of going through all of this with various cults and and different members and it's it, it there's a very interesting psychological line because if someone doesn't want to be deprogrammed they don't necessarily know that they're supposed to be deprogrammed so then they could say I'm not in a cult and yet everyone else knows he or she is so where where's that line become uh, uh, like a, a something you have to cross or because it's got to be different and completely relative in every case. Well, it could be the adult children of, uh, of a cult member. It could be in most cases, the parents of a cult member or the spouse of a cult member. And they're, they're looking at the involvement and they're thinking, this is destroying our lives. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is really a threatening thing. For example, what do you do if the cult says, you should not go to the doctor and you require medical attention. Uh, you're a diabetic and the group says, don't take insulin. Now that sounds kind of radical, but I've done two interventions where people almost died because they were refraining from taking insulin and they needed their injections to exist. So the families would be very concerned. It's a matter of life or death. And in many mm -hmm. cases, uh, the person, of course, will say, I'm not in a cult. Nobody says, oh, yes, of course, I'm in a cult. And, uh, right. <laughs> you know, my leader is not just a leader. Is a, This person is a cult leader and I'm brainwashed. So the process of deprogramming is identifying how the group fits the definition of a destructive cult, how they have used uh, coercive persuasion techniques to gain undue influence over that individual, and probably historical facts, information about the group that has been hidden and withheld deliberately. And then, of course, the family saying, look, this is why we're here. This is why we care. And, and we're worried about you. And so this deprogramming process can take three to four consecutive days. And the goal is to fully inform that person. And at the end, they're going to decide to stay, take a break, or leave the group entirely. I have a potentially weird question here. So it just popped into my head. <laughs> but has there any been, ever been any instance where one person is trying to exit what they believe is a cult, and yet there is no other person that can then kind of corroborate this idea that the person's in a cult. So the deprogramming ne isn't necessary for that one person. And yet that one person is claiming everyone else needs to be deprogrammed. Does that make sense? <laughs> I think what you are saying is someone leaves a group that has been called a cult. They're leaving of their own volition spontaneously. And they think having left that there's something wrong with the group and they're now going through their own process of deprogramming. Yeah, so then it's difficult to prove that it's actually a cult because nobody else thinks it is. So that's why I wrote the book, so that someone could start with the histories of, of modern cults, okay. go through defining a destructive cult, go through the chapter on coercive persuasion or cult brainwashing, look at the case vignettes of actual deprogramming cases, and that, in a sense, they could deprogram themselves by beginning and reading through that material. And in fact, uh, one, one man that I worked with, uh, Mark Vincente, 
who is in the HBO uh, documentary, The Vow. And I'm also in that documentary, which will now be going into its second season, which is about which is about Keith Raniere and Nexium. Mark Vincente, when he left, Nexium would would frequently call me on the phone. He was going through my book. And just for those listening, I was considered the arch enemy or nemesis of Nexium. Keith Ranieri, the leader of Nexium, who I have met and dealt with for many years, he sued me for 14 years before the lawsuit was dismissed in federal court. And then subsequently he was arrested. He sued me for publishing research papers that unraveled the way that Nexium uh, manipulated people and exposed it completely. Uh, culteducation.com was the first and for many years the only online resource with negative critical research about Nexium and Keith Ranieri. Mm. So, so I was considered essentially Satan by the group. <laughs> and when, when Mark Vicente first called me, he said that to me. He said, you know, Rick, uh, you are supposed to be the most evil person on the planet. Uh, the supreme suppressive person, Satan. And so that's what they told me. So when I realized that Keith Ranieri was a fraud and that the group was a cult, I thought, I got to get that guy's book. Because if Keith Ranieri is a cult leader and he's actually the bad guy, maybe this guy Ross is not so bad and he can help me. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mm -hmm. Mark and I spent hours and hours talking through uh, the themes and research material in the book. And that was very helpful for him to unwind what had happened. And I, I would suggest that for anyone leaving a group, because the majority of people that leave cults leave the cult on their own. They're not deprogrammed. But frequently, they have not unpacked what happened to them. They have not sorted it out. They left for some reason. They believed maybe even it was their fault. They weren't uh, good enough. They weren't strong enough. They, they should have stayed in the group. Uh, they often feel if the group is religious, that they have betrayed God. They have, uh, you know, gone into the hands of the devil mm-hmm. or whatever. And I think that everyone needs to, if you leave a group, do some very good reading, some research, talk to other ex-members that have left perhaps the same group and have already unpacked their baggage from the group so that you can understand that it's not your fault, you are not to blame, and that you, in fact, were victimized by the group and that the group is predatory. And in that way, you can recover more easily. Boy, there's so many d- different directions I want to go here. There's so many fascinating things that you said. Uh, I am kind of curious, though, for people who aren't really looking into this very much, I, I think a common thought is that, well, you know, cults had their heyday back in the 70s. Again, you, you mentioned the Moonies and, of course, you know, I get into the late 60s with, with the Manson cult. And But now in this modern age, this information age, cults won't really exist anymore because people can just Google things and learn and cults must be a, a thing of the past. And then, of course, Nexium. Uh, the news breaks about Nexium being a hugely destructive, uh, very modern cult. Um, how did you first become aware of that organization? A family came to me. They had four adult children that were involved in Nexium, And I proceeded to do one intervention after another. Three were successful. One was not. It was uh, very intense dealing with Nexium. At first, when I heard about it, I had no idea what Nexium was. Uh, they were calling it a seminar selling company offering a program called Executive Success Programs. Oh, God. And a lot of celebrities were, were going, uh, the Bronfmans, the heiresses, Sarah and Claire Bronfman to the Seagram's Liquor Fortune. Edgar Bronfman, a multi-billionaire, attended some of their programs. Uh, and then, you know, we could go on and on about others that were involved. And so at first, I had no idea what this was. But as I analyzed it, I fit it into the genre of large group awareness training, uh, which is a way of describing what these groups do. They bring you together for a seminar, 
Then they download the philosophy of the group as a cure-all panacea for everything in your life. And in Keith Ranieri's uh, particular uh, seminar, they downloaded a, a, a philosophy that he called rational inquiry, which was a melding of Scientology, Ayn Rand, uh, borrowing heavily from Scientology's ideas and concepts, for example, that some people are suppressive persons, which is a very negative connotation. Uh, and then also he did more or less a takeoff on uh, Amway's multi-level marketing approach. And then in addition to that, uh, he incorporated the kind of seminar structure that is used by Landmark Education, formerly called Earhart Seminars Training, which presents a seminar called The Forum, which is very popular. I've been invited and I've gone to a Landmark seminar. Oh, great. They sued me for a million dollars. They was, and then, I knew, I and then the they, moment. yeah. And then, and then they dismissed their own lawsuit rather than submit to discovery uh. Uh, after a judge told them that discovery would not be sealed and that it would be accessible to the public. Werner Erhard, uh, originally his name was Jack Rosenberg. He doesn't like me very much. Uh, <laughs> you know, I have been sued five times by different groups. I have been under surveillance by Scientology PIs, by PIs working for Nexium. I was on a death, uh, a death list uh, by a guru named Rama Bahara in Wisconsin, and I was under the protection of the Justice Department mm. for many months. And I've been under the protection of the FBI and the Homeland Security Department. So, you know, it's not, it's not. Um, it's not easy doing what I do, no. but I, I, I'll say this, that if they want to kill you and they sue you, it means you're actually accomplishing something or they wouldn't yeah. care or they wouldn't care. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, weird coincidence. Max and I are both talking to you from Wisconsin right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, so <laughs> no, no connection to I, I'd never even heard of that, uh, that guru you spoke of. Oh, yeah. He was in Wisconsin and his name was Rama Bahara. Now he calls himself, get this, Abraham Cohen. <laughs> and he's working he, He's working in Virginia, buying millions of dollars worth of real estate. Uh, the cult business is a big business. It's a burgeoning yeah. growth industry. Crazy. And rather, rather than being smaller, it's bigger than ever. And because of the internet, and social media, social platforms, you know, and like, for example, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, this is all being utilized by cults. And listen, going back to 1996, when I launched culteducation.com, I thought that the nature of the internet, having such quick access to information would be a uh, intense, uh, uh, catastrophe for cult groups that were hiding information from people like Scientology. However, it was ex it's, it's turned out to be exactly the opposite. And as we've seen with uh, many groups, they kind of create a bubble online, an echo chamber, where they follow only like-minded people on Twitter, on Facebook, they watch indoctrinational videos on YouTube, and they basically marinate marinate their minds online. And mm -hmm. uh, this is what's happening. There are cult groups now that recruit online, retain their members online. Uh, they get their money through PayPal or some other financial delivery system. And everything goes on online. And there, there are people like, for example, Teal Swan, who's been called the cult leader who have hundreds of thousands of followers online. This is actually a good uh, dovetail. It, it segues nicely into a, a question that Max and I were talking about before you joined us. Again, your book has kind of been, it's been very eye-opening and, and mind-opening too, because you mentioned some cults in your list uh, towards the beginning of the book again, that I've never thought of in the framework of a cult. And that was the Sibianese Liberation Army and the Taliban. 
even. I thought of these political groups just as political groups, even if they were radical. I never thought of them as a cult, but it does make sense when you when you you know spell it all out like that. And of course, that means you know Bin Laden, Osama Bin Laden, was a cult leader. And yeah, of course, that makes sense now that you think about it like that. I'm very fascinated and somewhat horrified by how. Uh, you know, as you were talking about, the Internet echo chamber has allowed conspiracy thought to really take off in unbelievable ways lately. Uh, do you think, even though there's not exactly a leader, a visual person that can come up and give a speech, uh, QAnon followers, is that, I mean, that's definitely cult-like, but would you consider that a cult? People that really, really believe in QAnon? Yes, I would. Oh, okay. I would most. That's that straight. De- I, I, <laughs> that's I would yes. most definitely. And uh, and whoever QAnon is, whether it's an individual or a collective, when they drop their their you know they do their Q drops, uh, the people that are following QAnon uh, take it in, believe it, and uh, at times there's what we call cognitive dissonance, which means that. They believe that something is going to happen. They're told something's going to happen, and then it doesn't happen. But just as quickly, QAnon offers its spin, an apology. And then this is why it didn't happen, and this is going to happen. And within the bubble online, that echo chamber constantly reinforcing what QAnon uh, believers think, what they feel, uh, they're able to hold that spin and accept it. And so I'd say QAnon is a destructive cult, in my opinion. And I would say most definitely ISIS, under the leadership of al-Baghdadi, was in fact a kind of a political cult or, or, and also a religious cult. And al-Qaeda, under Osama bin Laden, was a group that was uh, really a pariah within mainstream Islam. I mean, bin Laden was thrown out of Saudi Arabia. They didn't want him there. And he ended up in Afghanistan. And of course, he aligned himself with Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban. And these charismatic leaders created cult followings. And we can all see how destructive they they were and still are to some degree, even though after their deaths, the groups begin to disintegrate. And we can also see uh, the great leader Kim in North Korea as a cult leader. And we can understand most definitely that Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich would be an example of a political cult. There, there's a very large subject that I'd love to dive into right now, but <laughs> we are trying to uh, keep our podcast from going too currently political. But I guess I'll, I'll say a little bit in all of those political slash religious cults that you mentioned recently, you know, Taliban, North Korea, uh, the Nazis, etc., is I mean, there's a very strong reference to what they believe is the truth, even though that truth can be proven false, but other people believe it's true. So what is the psychology there in terms of selling someone a truth that you could actually prove false, (laughs) and yet you're going to believe it anyway? Well, if you control information, you control people's social socially, their social interaction, you isolate them socially, which is what destructive cults do. You can keep people within that bubble and you can keep the truth out. You can make sure by constantly reinforcing your control and discrediting anyone or anything that would contradict your your mindset, that even though the truth is out there, that it cannot permeate the bubble. Uh, And I'm going to bring up a name that I'm sure you're thinking, Donald Trump. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm going to say, number one, he's not a cult leader. Uh, Rather, he's a salesman. Mm -hmm. He understands what the base wants to hear, and he tools everything to make them listen and to uh, basically feed into the narrative that they already believe in. And I would say that proof of that is when he went to Alabama and he was giving one of his speeches at a rally and he referenced that he had taken the vaccine, that he had gotten booster shots and that everybody should get your shot, get your booster. He was booed. Mm -hmm. He was booed. And again, when he was with Bill O'Reilly in Texas and they talked about boosters and vaccinations, they were booed. 
And in my experience, nobody boos a cult leader. Mm. Uh, if you, it's just unheard. Of. No, that's true. Yeah. So, so what Donald Trump was able to do was tap into uh, what people really felt very deeply. And I think a lot of people would like to believe that Donald Trump's a cult leader and that uh, when he's gone, everything will be fine. Uh, people will just uh, get together, sing Kumbaya and, <laughs> and roast marshmallows instead of burning crosses. But uh, the bottom line is it goes deeper than that. And that's a very troubling thing. Talking about Trump getting booed after talking about taking the vaccine kind of reminded me, though, and again, I'm not trying to prove Trump is a <laughs> cult leader, uh, but is there a, a need within um, the upper level of a cult to create a desire or a need to get promoted within the group or level up as a way of showing your dedication and, you know, it makes me think of uh, Sheila with the, the Ranjishis. I, I can't remember if I'm saying that right up in. Yeah, Antelope. yeah. You're talking about Ma Sheila, who uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, who now is called Osho online and people watch his old videos and everything. Uh, he threw Ma Sheila under the bus big time. He took his Rolls Royces, people that don't know about uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. He was a professor at an Indian university before he came to the United States. And he was a kind of self-styled guru. He had an ashram uh, near Pune. And then he decided to move to the cash. And so he left India, moved to uh, Oregon, and created a city in the 1980s called Rajneeshpuram. And then subsequently tried to take over local government. Uh, and one of the schemes was to spread salmonella in local salad bars oh. and in order to make hundreds of people sick that would otherwise not vote the way he wanted. He wanted, wow. to, he wanted to take over local and county government uh, because they were saying, you can't build a city. Uh, you have to have zoning. You have to have permits. And he was basically saying, no, I don't. And mm -hmm. anyone that would disagree with him was labeled a bigot. Meanwhile, his followers were buying him Rolls Royces as yeah. gifts. Uh, and before he was deported, he had about 90 Rolls Royces. <laughs> uh, but, but, but when he was deported, and, and he was deported for all kinds of criminal you know, violations, uh, he just basically blamed it all on Mashila, and she ended up doing prison time. Oh. Now, now, now she's free and she's doing charitable work in Europe. Uh, but this is the story of a young woman who became absolutely infatuated and overwhelmed by a guru uh, who I would regard as a sociopath, possibly a psychopath, and it destroyed her life. Uh, I mean, he just took a few of his rolls and hit the road and ended up going back to India because no other country would allow him in. And Mashila went to prison because she was loyal to him and she was willing to take the fall for him. And that's what's happened over and over again in many groups. Look at Keith Raniere. Well, yeah, I was going to bring yeah, yeah Alex, exactly that up as an example. The uh, Allison Mack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Allison Mack. On one hand, I feel sorry for her because at one time she was a very successful actor with her whole life ahead of her, a very successful television series, Smallville. And then she lost everything, money, uh, her career, all sacrificed on the altar of Keith Raniere's desires. And she was basically a coach for sex slaves. And at one point she was the coach for India Oxenberg who I met and worked with. And I also work with her mother, Catherine Oxenberg, a very brave woman who decided that no one was going to take her daughter from her. For those that don't know the story of Nexium, Keith Raniere, typical psychopath cult leader who could never get enough, no matter how much money the Bronfmans gave him. And they gave him over a hundred million dollars. And mm. no matter how many women said, you can have me, it was never enough. It just kept going more, more, more until he was torturing women 
by branding them with a cauterizing iron, not him personally, but a doctor, a woman who was his follower, took a cauterizing iron and branded women with his initials, essentially, carving it into their flesh, uh, which would take over 30 minutes uh, for most with no anesthetic screaming, writhing in pain, and Ranieri watching it on video. I mean, this guy, talk about a misogynist. Yeah, right. Super misogynist. And when I met him, he was kind of the exception to the rule. Most cult leaders are charismatic, and you can understand why people follow follow them. Keith Ranieri is like this little weird garden gnome of a guy. I mean, and he literally stinks. The guy doesn't like to take showers. <laughs> and, uh, and, and when I first met him, I was totally unimpressed. And then when I sat through his deposition, which went on for hours, uh, I couldn't believe how many lies he had told his followers. Uh, he had told them that he had an IQ over 225 when the guy is probably average. He told them that he was a brilliant student in in uh, in college, and he was um, just a average student at best who struggled. So the only thing Keith Ranieri ever did that was of any consequence, uh, as far as being intelligent, if you would, if you could call it that, was he was a virtual savant when it came to manipulating people. He could smell weaknesses, and then he would drill into people and leverage those weaknesses to gain control over them. He did that to Allison Mack, and now she's in prison, serving, uh, I think, almost four years. Mm. And I, I feel sorry for her, but there's a line you cross yeah. when you're a cult follower and you do criminal acts. And in the case of Allison Mack, she did horrible things, but she cooperated with the prosecution gave them a recording, a recorded uh, conversation uh, that she had with Keith Raniere that helped to convict him. He is serving right now 120 years in prison. Good. And, and Claire Bronfman got seven years, despite all of her wealth. And uh, Nancy Salzman, who was number two in command, got away with, uh, I think, 3.5 years but you know what? She should have gotten more, in my yeah. opinion. Uh, but she was the first one to flip. Mm. She was uh, number two, uh, made a lot of money, uh, lived the good life as a result of being with Renary and Nexium. But nevertheless, she turned on him before anybody else and managed to get a good deal. We'll, we'll probably never know the exact answer, but I, I... I wonder what his next step was going to be. Uh, I, I saw the series that you were in seduced inside the Nexium cult, which was really exceptionally well done. Uh, that's on stars. Um, but yeah, it, it, towards the end of that series, they talk about how he started doing more militaristic type training. Do you have any idea where he was going to go with that? Yeah, I think oh. he was, I think he was going to weaponize the inner core of women that were devoted to him. I think he was going to send them out to kill people. Jeez. Uh, and I, <laughs> I was concerned because I knew I was high on the list. Uh, so was Tony Natale, his former girlfriend, uh, who wrote a book called The Program, uh, which is about her experiences with Nancy Salzman, Keith Ranieri. Uh, he stalked her for, uh, for 20 years, 20 years, simply because she said, you know, Keith, I'm done. I don't want to be your girlfriend anymore. He, could, he never got over it. Keith Ranieri could never accept anyone saying the word no to him. No, I don't want to be your friend anymore. No, I don't want to go out with you anymore. No, I don't uh, wish to take things down uh, that are published online that are critical about you. So he, I think, was planning to weaponize a core group of women that followed him. And they were probably going to be sent out to kill his perceived enemies. Uh, Tony Natale and myself, I think we would be very high on the list. Uh, Catherine Oxenberg, who was fighting him with every ounce of her being uh, to free her daughter, India, 
she would be in jeopardy. I think it was Catherine Oxenberg more than any one single person that was responsible for Keith Raniere's demise. And in fact, the irony of, of this misogynist's end was the fact that women did him in. Uh, Tony Natale, Catherine Oxenberg, Sarah Edmondson, uh, and others uh, who really uh, knew firsthand what kind of a guy he was and exposed him. And in the case of Catherine Oxenberg, who is a well-known actor and had done a very successful work in films and on, on television, she was able to leverage her celebrity to expose Keith Raniere. I remember when she looked at me and said, you know, I can't get my daughter out the easy way, the quiet way, uh, in a low profile kind of way. So I guess I'm just gonna have to take the whole cult down. And I, I looked at her and I said, Catherine, that's bold talk. And she said, well, that's what I'm gonna do because nobody takes my daughter. And then when she found out that India had literally been branded, uh, that, that put her over the edge. I and can't she imagine. said, I will fight. I will do whatever I have to do. And for years, people, and this is a story with many cults that I've dealt with, that when the cult finally goes down, you find out that for years and years, people work were going to authorities or they were talking publicly about all the criminal activities in the group, whether it be sexual abuse, tax fraud, um, sex trafficking or whatever. And nobody does anything. They just don't want to get into it for whatever reason. And what Catherine Oxenberg did was she said, look, if you guys don't go after Keith Ranieri, I will go public repeatedly, and I will say, I went to so-and-so. I sat in their office. I gave them the information. I gave them documentation, and they're not doing anything. And so I think she was the impetus, the, 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 the fire under, if you will, the butts of a few people. Um, though I would say that um, the, the Brooklyn federal prosecutors uh, were pretty fired up on their own. But for people in Albany, New York, politicians, law enforcement, criminal prosecutors that had been told for years and years that Keith Raniere, who, who was based in the Albany uh, area of upstate New York, was systematically committing crimes day after day after day, and they did nothing. It took people in Brooklyn uh, to go after Keith Raniere. Just crazy. I mean, we, we share a lot of fantastic stories, <laughs> obviously, on our podcast here. And I mean, we the Nexium cult story is just, uh, you know, it's it's over the fantastic level. Thank you for doing what you do, just because, you know, most people don't even know these things are happening. Got to get out there and fix the problem, is, is to put it <laughs> extremely lightly. Um, but let we'll, we'll move on to a, a Slightly more lighthearted topic. <laughs> kind of go through some. I know you have one great example of a movie that goes into cults in a narrative way. And what what do you think is the best one that covers that? The absolutely best film that I have ever seen, and I've pretty much seen them all, is Mary Marcy May Marlene, uh, starring Elizabeth Olsen. Uh, she plays a cult member who leaves a particular small cult after she witnesses a murder. And it's her journey uh, of recovery and her struggle. Uh, and it's so real. It's absolutely vividly real. It's eerie how that script was so accurate in illustrating the dynamics of a small cult, what it would be like to live in one, what it would be like to leave, and how difficult it is when you, when you don't really fully understand uh, cult dynamics and, and, and cult techniques of coercive persuasion, that how do I recover from this? You know, you talk about PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress. Uh, Elizabeth Olsen has that, she has nightmares. Uh, she goes to her sister. Uh, her sister struggles to understand 
what has happened. And Elizabeth Olson can't articulate it, is ashamed, can't talk about it until very near the end of the film. Finally, there is hope that she will see someone professionally, a psychotherapist, to receive professional counseling. But even then, it can be difficult if that counselor has no experience dealing with former cult members. Uh, they may find it hard to believe what they're hearing. So it, this movie, uh, Mary Marcy, May Marlene, is probably the best at really showing you what it's all about. So somewhat on the same topic, how, how were you involved in this, the, the, that really popular video game, Far Cry 5? Oh, wow. That was a, that was a trip. I got a call from Ubisoft, the makers of Far Cry, the video game that is in a series. And they said, hey, come to Montreal and let's talk about you being part of the development team. Uh, and and we will, we, we're going to work on a video game called Far Cry 5 which became a video game about being embedded in a cult compound. Uh, you are a federal agent or sheriff, law enforcement. You come into this compound to arrest the leader, and it goes sideways. Everyone's shooting. There's violence. The group is using drugs to subdue people. Uh, and you're in this vast compound, uh, and you're trying to get out. You're struggling to get out. And so I worked with Dan Hay, the, the artistic director of Far Cry 5 and others, to kind of give it a sense of authenticity, of reality. And what Ubisoft was able to put out is very, very real. Uh, they have this uh, cult leader who's a composite character, but very much like David Koresh. And they have a compound very similar to the Church Universal and Triumphant, which uh, is a group that was led ironically by a woman, Elizabeth Clare Prophet, and they had a, an enormous uh, compound in Montana that was formerly uh, the Malcolm Forbes Ranch. And uh, so they incorporated various aspects of other cults. For example, there is a drug used in the game called Bliss, that subdues people. Uh, this is something that actually happened mm. in a cult compound in Chile, led by a man by the name of Paul Schaefer called Colonia Dignidad. Within that compound, all of the people that were under Schaefer were routinely given daily doses of tranquilizers to make them more passive and more Jesus. docile. So it, they incorporated that into Far Cry 5. And of course, Far Cry 5 would go on to make hundreds of millions of dollars for Ubisoft. Uh, it was quite popular. And I helped in its rollout, traveling with the, with the development team as, it was, amazing. as yeah. it was premiered in Europe and, and also in Australia and so on. But it was a wonderful experience. I had never even played a video game. <laughs> and uh, the first video game I ever played was Far Cry 5. Oh, for wow. <laughs> you, skipped, you skipped Pong and Super Mario and went straight to Far Cry 5. <laughs> oh, man. So we want to be, of course, respectful of your time, but there are so many things I want to ask. Um, before we stop, uh, finish talking about screenplays, you know, we, we highlighted uh, a great film. But what what do you see filmmakers getting wrong that uh, that they you know, maybe it's the same thing over and over again, since we do have a lot of uh, writers that are listening to this episode. Well, I think, first of all, satanic cults, that's a fantasy. Oh, I mean, that's the satanic panic of the 1980s. And that turned out to be just totally bogus. Yeah. So so there are all of these fantasies about the cult of Satan and they're sacrificing babies and all kinds of crazy screenplays and movies like that. That's not true. Uh, Rosemary's baby is a fantasy. Uh, but what I think most people don't get is the kind of slow drip drip of cult brainwashing. How mm. does it really work? It works in small, subtle increments. It's not, overtly obvious it creeps up on you and that's why people uh for example i have worked with five medical doctors 
in deprogramming interventions, including an orthopedic surgeon and an anesthesiologist. Uh, people that get taken in by cults are not dumb people. Uh, in fact, cults don't want people that are dumb or people that are disabled in some way because they want them to be productive and useful. Uh, so I think we're, what we often get wrong is we blame the victim. We say that somehow there's something wrong with them. That's why they got involved in the group. It could never happen to a normal, healthy person. And that's wrong. Uh, what also is wrong is thinking that it comes on strong when it comes on in a very subtle way in increments. And by the time you're laying on a table being branded in Nexium, you have gone through many seminars, you have uh, gone through a long process that has rendered your ability to critically think uh, inoperable. And so that's what I think they get wrong. They get the process wrong. They get the people wrong. They kind of blame the victims, say they're, they're probably screwed up. Uh, the, only, the only consistent narrative that I would say uh, you could see in cult victims would be that maybe at a time in their life that things were not going well, that they were depressed, they were unhappy, that they had they had the bad luck at that point to bump into a destructive cult that recruited them. That typically, uh, that is a story I often hear. And it's also reminiscent of the book by Eric Hoffer, The True Believer, in which uh, Hoffer wrote in the 50s. And he said, look, if there's a group like the Nazi Third Reich or a communist revolution, it doesn't happen where the country is happy and everything's going well. It happens when people are unhappy and anxious about the future. And then some leader comes along and tells them, I've got, I've got the answer. I can, I can change things to make everything better and alleviate your, your concern, your stress. And so it, in the case of, of cult victims, very often they were going through a bad patch but then we all go through bad patches. So I don't think that makes them any different than all the rest of us. Well said. It's so much information to take in, but I think what's the, I think the, the excellent point you're making is that movies are movies. They're there for entertainment purposes and they're, you know, not always there to hit truth perfectly, although there's definitely a place for that, because much like, you know, just like the, the movie with Elizabeth Olsen that you reference, and you can get it right and still have this incredibly engaging oh, um, yeah. movie, you know. Yeah. Um the point I think for a writer is that you, you can't if you're if you want to tell an authentic cult related story you can't rush it you have to lay that groundwork yeah. and you know find a way to pace it and show time passing that it's not uh you know a blink of an eye suddenly you're shaving your head and and <laughs> praising your allegiance and giving away all your possessions uh there's a journey for the your main character if, if it is your main character that's uh, being pulled into a cult I would say to anyone thinking about doing a screenplay regarding a cult or, or any type of entertainment, uh, you know, project that they, first of all, do extensive research, dig into these groups as mm -hmm. they really are, because quite frankly, the reality is much scarier and, and more intense and, and will engage an audience much more than if you kind of do some kind of, you know, not real, not genuine kind of screenplay. Yeah. So, so, you know, there, there have been incredibly horrible, horrible things that cults have done over the, you know, decades, you know, going all the way back to the Sibianese Liberation Army, and then right up to today with, with Nexium, with ISIS, with Al Qaeda, and you can get that kind of dynamic that is very sinister, very scary, uh, very dark and fascinating by getting to the core of what cults are really like. Again, there's so many things I want to talk to you about and ask you about. Uh, and and you made reference just recently uh, as you were talking about Far Cry, uh, but we'd love to hear your experience with the Branch Davidians. And I know for me personally, 
seeing Waco unfold on television uh, as a younger person at that time, I was born in 1980. This happened in 1993. Uh, that was kind of my first introduction that this is something that happens. Cults exist. Um, yeah, I would just love to hear about your introduction to the group and, and what your experience was during that insane time uh, in history. Okay. Well, first of all, I know it's a, a huge lot, question a, here. <laughs> a, a, no, the, let, let's start with a lot of what you see on television about Waco is just crap. It's just total crap. Mm. Uh, the book uh, written by uh, a supposed survivor of the Waco Davidian standoff, David, David Thibodeau, is at best muddled. And uh, Thibodeau really wasn't in the group that long. Uh, he really didn't see that much. He was like, uh, you know, just kind of on the fringe, so to speak. He was in the compound, but he he really didn't un understand the group, I don't think. Uh, what most people don't realize is David Koresh was a pedophile. He raped children. He raped children as young as 10 years old, that there were uh, children giving birth to babies, that were David mm -hmm. Koresh's children. That was the reason he never wanted to leave the compound because he knew that DNA testing would prove uh. which children were his wives, so-called wives, and which children were the babies of these minor children. So he was a pedophile, he was a rapist, uh, and of course he stockpiled weapons illegally. Another thing people don't realize about the Waco Davidians is that it was a very peaceful group for a long time. Uh, it was strange. It was unusual, but they didn't hurt anybody. The group goes all the way back to the time of Victor Howdiff in the 1930s. Howdiff was kind of a weird guy. He thought he was a prophet. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, which he had joined, asked him politely to leave. Uh, because they didn't recognize his supernatural claims about his prophetic gifts. So he created his own group called the Branch Davidians, bought a bunch of land outside of Waco, Texas. And there he lived, and there his followers were very peacefully for many years. Howdiff died, his wife took over. Uh, she decided to retire, sold some of the land, moved to California. And then a man by the name of George Roden, took over the group. And when he died, his widow, Lois Roden, took over, who was, by all accounts, a very nice person. And it was then that this drifter named Vernon Howell, who would later be known as David Koresh, came into the group. And I think that Lois Roden kind of saw him as a, a, like a son. Some say they had more than that kind of relationship. But she was quite old and uh, would eventually die. And then uh, Vernon Howell would vie for becoming her successor against her son, George Roden Jr. Uh, there would be a shootout. Korish would be prosecuted for attempted murder, but released after the jury was hung. Most of them wanted to find him guilty, but a couple held out and he walked. And when he went back to the compound, he became the king of that compound. And then the Davidians took a very dark turn. They started stockpiling weapons. And increasingly, Korish, uh, like Keith Raniere, could never have enough uh, submission, could never have enough uh, sex with the women and children, and could never have enough guns. Uh, they started modifying semi-automatic weapons into fully automatic. They had machine guns. They had a huge arsenal and a vast stockpile of ammunition and explosives. And leading up to the Waco Davidian standoff, uh, I deprogrammed a number of Davidians, two from a rival Davidian sect and one from the actual Waco Davidian compound. And that person that I deprogrammed would later talk with the BATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And his testimony would be part of the affidavit used for issuing the warrant to search the Waco Davidian compound. Uh, one of the things that I found shocking was that the way they approached the compound, uh, both 
I and the young man that I deprogrammed told them how many weapons there were. There was no doubt in my mind that they knew that this was a very heavily armed group. And I also told them that they were preparing for the end of the world, doomsday, and that they saw anyone coming to their compound as potentially part of Satan's plan to destroy them. That's how brainwashed they were. Hmm. And of course, the BATF uh, just cowboyed the whole thing and went in there as if it was like a raid by the untouchables, you know, uh, <laughs> raiding, a, raiding some kind of bootleg operation when, in fact, this was a very heavily armed compound. And they had been tipped off before the BATF even knocked on the door. So what happened was a gun battle where people died. And then subsequently, there was this 51-day standoff. And I was brought in by the FBI to uh, one of their offices in Dallas. And at the time, I was working for CBS News as an analyst, basically explaining how these uh, Davidians thought and how David Koresh uh, wielded his power. He changed his name to David Koresh to reflect a prophecy about someone named Koresh and also the name David being of the house of David, that he was the Messiah. He called himself the sinful Messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, and and Koresh, Koresh was very sinful, of course, in yeah. the way in which he treated everyone in the compound. No one except David Koresh or whatever woman or female child he chose could have sex. So even if there was a married couple, he would separate them. The men would be celibate. Everyone would be celibate until they were chosen by him. Oh my God. And so this, during that standoff, there were many things that I advised the FBI, some of which they used, uh, much of which they ignored. And I think one of my regrets going back through the 51 day standoff is that I did not publicly come out and talk about what the FBI was not doing. Uh, I thought at the time, and I think I was wrong, if I came out and I talked about it, that the FBI wouldn't listen to me or other people like me at all. But in reality, I think I probably would have been better off going public. What I had told them is that they should bring families down to talk to their loved ones. Uh, they had set up a number of loudspeakers around the compound, which they were using to keep the Davidians up all night with rock and roll music and rab recordings of rabbits screaming, hmm, uh, which was a hostage terrorist strategy. Yeah. It had nothing whatsoever to do with the Davidians. It, it was totally different. Now, in fairness to the FBI, they had never dealt with this kind of a situation before. Subsequently, they learned a lot from Waco and also from Ruby Ridge uh, with Randy Weaver. Yeah. Uh, which was another standoff they had. But what they didn't understand is the intensity of the commitment of the people in the compound and what they were willing to do, which is die for what they believed. And so the way to approach them was not to feed into the narrative that David Koresh told them, which was they are of Satan. Satan is attacking the compound, but rather use the loudspeakers to pierce the bubble that Koresh had created in the compound so that people, specifically moms, dads, brothers, sisters, children, could communicate with the people in the compound and say, I'm here for you. I love you. Mm -hmm. If you come out of the compound, I have a lawyer. We're going to help you. You are not going to be shot and killed. But the FBI did not utilize that strategy. What they did do, though, is... They did talk with him through the Bible, which I had recommended, and uh, they reasoned with him that, look, you know, Jesus loved the little children. Jesus said, suffer not the children to come unto me, and he, he loved children. So shouldn't you also show that since you're claiming to be a Messiah, that you are like Jesus, mm -hmm. and therefore you will not allow the children to suffer. And he did release 21 children uh, from, from the compound. And there were a number of older people that he released. But ultimately, there were more that stayed. 
and there were children that stayed. And at the end, and there are all these conspiracy theories about what happened and everything that have been proven wrong over and <laughs> over and over again in court, uh, criminal cases, in lawsuits, et cetera, ad nauseum. Here's what actually happened. The FBI got tired and they decided wrongfully, in my opinion, to just go in. Uh, in other standoffs since, their attitude would be, hey, we'll just stay out here indefinitely uh, because we don't want anybody to be hurt. We don't want anybody to die. We remember Waco. We yeah. remember Ruby Ridge. But what they did at Waco was they went in and David Koresh had a plan that he implemented, which it was to burn the place down. How do we know this? We know this because the FBI sent in food that Koresh had requested. And in those food supplies were bugging devices. Mm -hmm. So they literally recorded and heard in real time, people talking about setting the fire. Uh, we also know this from the forensic evidence in the residue of the compound showing that accelerants, fuel oil was used to set the fire. We also know this from aerial infrared photography, that there were th at least three ignition points uh, that were recorded that were virtually simultaneous and consistent with the audio recordings that they were setting fire to the compound deliberately. And we also know this from FBI agents who were put in the most horrible position when they were trying to rescue people and those people that they would reach out to and say, please come here, I'll, I'll help you. And they would instead run screaming into the flames <sighs> because they wanted to die with David Koresh. Wow. And, and that was his plan. If I cannot be king of the compound, I don't want to be alive. And very much like Jim Jones and Marshall Applewhite, who, who exterminated their groups when they decided to die uh, in horrible murder suicides uh, of Heaven's Gate and Jonestown, David Koresh decided these people are mine. I own them. And if they don't have me, they have no purpose. And therefore, in this kind of narcissistic, malignant rage of his, he decided, as I go, you're all going. And most importantly, my children. And I think there were 18, 19 children that died in that fire. It was a horrible tragedy. But despite the mistakes made by the BATF and the FBI, the real culprit always was David Koresh. He was the one who committed crimes that caused the BATF to stage the raid. And he was the one that ultimately decided to kill himself and everyone else. Well, that's a, a fantastic story of sorts. Uh, it, it is very important to be aware of this history, that these are things that are possible. Uh, you, you mentioned in the book this belief that a lot of people have. They're like, oh, these guys were just, they were minding their own business. Could have just left them alone. Well, as you had talked about in the book and just now, there was horrible crimes against children that were happening already. And as you just mentioned, Marshall Applewhite with the Heaven's Gate cult, that was a cult that also was not being pursued by no. law enforcement or anything like that. No. And it still ended with a mass suicide. So these things do happen even without, you know, it, it, the FBI intervention was absolutely, or law enforcement intervention was certainly needed uh, and continues to be needed among these destructive cults. These are horrible, horrible organizations. Let me just underline that point is that when Heaven's Gate suicide occurred, that was 1995, not long after the Solar Temple also, uh, another bizarre cult in Europe, uh, some 80, 90 people died through what may have been a murder or may have been mass suicide. And there was no, no one from law enforcement that was pursuing them. Yeah. This happened because the leader, Luc Jure, decided it. Uh, in the same sense, the 39 people that died in Heaven's Gate in a leased mansion uh, between Los Angeles and San Diego, uh, no one basically even knew much about them. This was a group that was flying below everyone's radar. I didn't know very mm. much about them. Uh, Marshall Applewhite was an obscure leader 
leading this small, small group that was totally cut off from everyone and everything. And in the end, it was his choice, not brought about by anything other than his sick mind. He had been in and out of mental institutions to end him, his life and end the group. So many people will say, well, if you just leave them alone, nothing will happen. Well, tell that to the families of the people that died at Heaven's Gate, the people that died in the Solar Temple. And also, let's take note of Aum Shinrikyo. This was a group in Japan led by Shoko Asahara, a kind of self-styled Buddha. And he had his members gas the Tokyo subway system. Hmm. I think that was also in, in 95 or 96. So thousands of Japanese were hospitalized. Many died because the gas they released was the same gas, sarin, that was used by the Nazis to exterminate people hmm. in concentration camps. Hmm. So Shoko Asahara wasn't really being pursued. And later, many in Japan would say, why not? Why wasn't he being pursued? Because look what he did. So uh, the idea that cults will just be benign when they aren't intrinsically is, uh, you know, just a, a, a complete wrong conclusion. Are there groups that are harmless? Yes. But when they step over the line of criminality, uh, everyone must be under the law. Yeah. And that includes them. I think the through line through all of this is narcissism and, and how narcissism going unchecked look what it can produce. I mean, if, if someone is a true narcissist, it's, it's, it seems like all of these people who were the cult leaders, they could never have enough or get enough. Um, yeah. And then through the narcissistic behavior that they were you know, showing to their members, it was, I mean, this is obviously just my opinion in terms of what I'm taking from all of this, but that really psychosis became, it just, it's never going to just level out. <laughs> It's just going to get worse and worse. Yeah, I think that uh, they've been described, cult leaders, as malignant narcissists. Sure. So if you look at narcissistic personality disorder and you look at that profile, you're looking at a cult leader. Yeah. Uh, they, they, a potential cult leader, because they, they lack empathy. Uh, I mean, they just don't feel anything about what they do. To them, right and wrong means what's right for me is right and what's wrong for me is wrong. Yeah. And it's just about me. The world revolves around me. And, you know, it's not about what they believe. It's about how they behave. Yeah. Do they and they behave badly, many of these groups. And uh, I don't some of them are religious. Many of them, like uh, Nexium, are not religious at all. But those that are religious will seek tax exemption. And when you want to hold them accountable uh, for maybe financial chicanery or whatever crimes they've committed, they they scream, oh, you're persecuting me. No, I don't think so. <laughs> if, if you are in a country, whether it be the U.S. or, or the U.K. Or, or wherever, Japan, you are accountable under the law of that country. And if you do things that are criminal expect to be prosecuted. Yeah. Well, this is an extraordinarily important topic. I, I, I love that we're able to discuss it here. Try to just make everybody else more aware that this is something that is ongoing. This is something that is a, a feature of our society, unfortunately. So it's it's good to just bring the awareness to it. Uh, so everybody listening, please, if you're interested at all, do check out the Cult Education Institute. That is culteducation.com and uh, Rick's book, Cults Inside Out, How People Get In and Can Get Out. Also, as he mentioned, The Vow season two is coming out in October on HBO. Uh, I look forward to checking that out. And I do, I'll say again, uh, Seduced, uh, the the miniseries that you also were featured in was a really, really great look at the Nexium cult as well. Is there any other uh, place that you'd like to direct people to? Well, I would say that uh, there also is a message board, a public message board attached to the Cult Education Institute, where people can share their insights mm -hmm. about groups they've been affected by anonymously, or if they're a family member, talk about groups they're concerned about that a loved one might be affected by. Uh, also, uh, people can follow me on Twitter, 
Rick Allen Ross on Twitter. And there's also a Facebook in institutional page for the Cult Education Institute. Uh, and Twitter and Facebook are places where people can follow links to breaking stories about cults, which are happening virtually every single day. Mm. And people aren't aware of it. But, you, you know, if you if you follow me on Twitter or you go to the Facebook institutional page of the Cult Education Institute, you can see where what's happening in the world and where cults are creating problems. And where is that message board? How can you find that? The message board would be at culteducation.com, and then you would just click through to the message board. Great. Cool. You are a wealth of information, Rick, and, and uh, your experience obviously speaks for yourself. I hope you just keep doing what you're doing because it's important. And we're honored to have you on our podcast. This was great. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for listening. As I say at the end of every, of, uh, every episode that we have here, uh, there are fantastic stories everywhere. If you hear of one, if you know of one, reach out, let us know. You might be inducted as the next member of the Fantastic Story Society. Scott, Rick, thanks so much. And everybody, have a great, great day. 